Nick Mercer. And if it's just me today, no Aaron Goldfold today. She is, she's busy doing work for the Valor Valuable Records to say for the Newfoundland Labrador Brain Brain Injury Association. So I will before I get started talking to Dr. Francis Skinner, I will first like to thank our sponsor, Head Check Health. Concussion Talk Podcast is presented by Head Check Health. Head Check Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. To our organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada, who rely on Head Check Health to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. Okay, so uh, Dr. Skinner, um, I read you had a engineering degree and you were and you and then you became interested in neuroscience so could you please just is that right first of all and then could you just explain your your uh your academic background and your and then your and your interest how you came to grow interest in neuroscience from engineering okay so um yeah so thank you for uh the chance to chat today First of all, and um, yeah, so I've been competition. I'm a computational neuroscientist, as you mentioned, at the Kremble Brain Institute here at the University Health Network. And um, I started off in uh, applied math and computer science um, in my first degree, but I actually did not get into neuroscience until my postdoctoral studies when I was in Boston. Um, and <laughs> sort of, there's a lot of in between details. Um, um, but I, I sort of, for me, it was always about trying to bring mathematics and biology together in terms of what I was interested in. Um, I've always loved math, um, and I originally wanted to be a, a vet, actually, because oh, yeah. of loving animals. So, yeah, so I was um, originally planning to become a veterinarian, and I actually had <laughs> been, been accepted into University of Guelph, had a scholarship, and everything else was happening. But because I've always loved math, I got... Um, uh, coerced, so to speak, because of this new math program at the University of Waterloo. So I ended up there, but as I, I think I was sort of saying that I ended up in biomedical engineering for graduate studies because I was, you know, I always, I sort of wanted to have this combination of biology and math, and I didn't know how best to kind of do that. So I went that way, but I still didn't feel like I had enough of this sort of interaction. And so um, in, in my postdoctoral studies, for reasons of, you know, I, I was got married in the time, my husband is in astronomy, and we were trying to find life together. So we ended up in Boston, and the lab that I, I ended up being was a neuroscience lab. So even though I came in there initially not doing neuroscience because of trying to seek this combination of biology and math, I was very, very fortunate with the group I ended up there. And that's kind of how I got into sort of neuroscience and computational neuroscience, which was sort of in those days, not sort of a clear, uh, you know, a recognizable word, let's put it that way, as a field. Um, but it really sort of um, got me very excited because I felt here I could kind of take advantage of my love of math and mathematical modeling and be involved in biological systems. In, a, in, in this case, it happened to be neuroscience, but it was actually crabs and lobsters, neural networks and crabs and lobsters at that time. But it was really about trying to understand how these networks, you know, produce their output using mathematical models as a tool. So uh, yeah, that short <laughs> story. <laughs> that, so uh, I guess so I guess if you did there describe generally what is computa- computational neuroscience. When I saw that in your profile, I can't say that thought. That's interesting or that, or even though it's a fairly big field, and I'd never, i never heard of computational neuroscience. So could you please just define that? And actually, and why that? Just to. How how do uh, well, you know I just just define that first? So if you define the computational sure. neuroscience. Yep, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, that's that's a fantastic question to ask at this stage because depending on who you talk to, you might get slightly different answers. But I think um, the way I would sort of uh, describe it is so. First of all, it's a very interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary field. So um, you know, of course, mathematics, physics, engineering biology, physiology, psychology, and all these fields. So it's very uh, interdisciplinary. But what is sort of, um, um, say, different about it is we're all neuroscientists, but we're using sort of mathematical, theoretical tools to help us sort of understand the most complex organ in our bodies, which is the brain. So so um, 
I, I, and I would uh, distinguish it from, say, artificial intelligence or machine learning, because those, of course, are other fields, but computational or science may use tools of machine learning, all the rest of it, but okay. the emphasis is on trying to understand the biological system. So this is interaction with experimental work, and the biological system in this case is, is the brain, and so therefore myself and many other people in the field, it's about neurological disease, because it's such a complex organ to understand, and we really, you know, trying to bring mathematical theoretical tools to help in that endeavor. I guess that's how I describe the field. That's a yeah, that's a pretty heavy uh, description there. So, uh, so actually, well, for, I just well, I know you're interested in the hippocampus. So uh, this, so I guess, kind of show your your biology, your brain, your not your neuroscience shops. Could you explain why you think the, the hippocampus is so important? And, uh, and what it does, basically what it does, where it is, how it relates to the other parts of the brain and their function. Yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a really nice time to answer this question, actually, thank you, because the hippocampus is a brain hub. <laughs> so, of course, it's about the whole brain, but, um, you know, more and more studies, like whether it's from sort of uh, uh, imaging, connectomic, theoretical, uh, studies is really sort of pointing to the hippocampus, which is sort of deep inside um, this, inside your brain. Um, it's sort of a banana-shaped object, part of the medial temporal lobe, the seat of um, often where seizures start, uh, Alzheimer's, like that, that sort of seems to be uh, changes happening there. But a lot of studies point out it's been a hub. So it's important, we know from many studies that's important in memory and learning, and it's been studied experimentally for, by many labs because of the accessibility of the experimental preparation of a slice. So many, many different reasons. But the hippocampus is an essential brain structure with learning and memory. And what is what we're finding is that it's connected to, well, every part of the brain is connected, but it seems to be a key uh, hub. So, you know, if we think about airports and, you know, going on, it's, it, you know, it's sort of like New York or Chicago, it would seem that things have to flow through there. It's an information core in the brain exactly how and what it's done is you know we don't know but it's just studies are pointing to that being sort of a hub in terms of the brain brain functioning in general yeah that that's sort of the short version i would say of to answer your question hopefully it's yeah okay sorry yeah okay great i uh, know and uh, so so how does that relate to say so how would the hippocampus would your saying the hippocampus in relation to brain disease and also, obviously, you said they admit it serves an adorable role in memory creation, but uh, how does it, how does that relate to, say, the brain diseases like Alzheimer's or maybe a brain injury? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so okay, so I'm the computational neuroscience person, so um, not the experimental expert, but because of our models being tightly integrated with experimental work, there's a lot of data that sort of experimental data that you know, points to the hippocampus as sort of where, you know, uh, the uh, pathological state sort of starts in terms of, say, Alzheimer's disease, where seizures might start. And so um, the hippocampus, because it's heavily studied, there's a lot of pieces of information. I see it as a puzzle. So from a mathematical model perspective, we can sort of um, try to sort of put those pieces together as in a puzzle and sort of figure out how this emerges. Like, you know, we might know certain cell types might be more susceptible in dying or the connection changes, but it's this big mess of complexity. So the modeling, the way I see it is sort of to try to untangle and decipher these changes. So in brain disease, um, one of the sort of, um, I think, pretty clear hallmarks now is oscillatory activity. So this is where so our modeling and many of the labs modeling is focused, is how do sort of the electrical activities that are recorded change in disease. And so the electrical activity is something that we can record, whether it's sort of right inside the brain or on the brain surface. And these rhythms of different frequencies are I mean, been known since the 1920s. How they're generated, you know, there's different ideas, and this is where our models are, I think, are contributing some understanding. But what a lot of experimental studies have shown is you have these oscillatory activities, say a theta rhythm, which is the most robust one in the hippocampus, which is about three to 12 hertz. It interacts with another high frequency oscillation in about 40 hertz. And in a normal state, it has a certain pattern. 
and in an Alzheimer's state or epileptic state or, you know, any sort of brain disorder, pathological state, it changes in very specific ways. So it's kind of, you know, maybe you can think of it, you know, people th talk about it as a biomarker of sort of seeing when, you know, disease starts and sort of trying to sort of uh, diagnose it. So that this is, you know, one of the ways that we think about it. And then, of course, try to put it back to its, you know, correct normal state if we understand it how to do that right again that, that makes sense kind of like you know they're trying to do uh and get more immediate uh definition of definitely what it can when a condition occurs and, and uh, i know those bio blood biomarkers is one thing that they've tried and i don't know how it's a reliable there yet but uh the oscillation isn't also i don't know how quickly we did to test oscillation is in the hippocampus but that sort of thing would be a it's a good way to, to maybe be it's an interesting, not necessarily good, but an interesting way to find out where the, uh, when, uh, say, a, a concussion or any brain injury has occurred. Not exactly. necessarily in the hippocampus, but like in wherever. In yep, the, so, exactly. Surgery. Exactly. Yeah you, yeah, you got it. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's, you know, it's the tools we have and more sophisticated tools are being developed. Yeah. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, I just want to... With my uh, my my co-host there, Aaron Gilbo, she did a, a, a graduate diploma at Mohawk College about brain disorders. So she may have, she would have some uh, definite more uh, brain disorder questions here because I'm not as aware of specific brain disorders that may be of interest. But um, what I asked about the the brain in general is we I just I just put Lawrence up with my. Another one of the not co, but my former host of a not former current host of of the Phoenix Discussion podcast this is on my podcast. Um, Lawrence actually did a course about the brain and concussions and stuff. So I talked about the brain very, 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 geez, very briefly. They mentioned the lobes and the temporal lobe, frontal lobe and the occipital lobe and the and the and the brainstem and the lobes and corpus callosum and stuff and. And yeah, and uh, so, but uh, I was going to mention that I wanted to ask you about the, because I think computational, what I'm hearing from you is that computational neuroscience is about sh kind of showcasing how the brain is so complex, yet still integrated, and how, and I guess mathematical modeling, modeling is a good way to kind of demonstrate that, or a good way to theorize about that and showcase how maybe you can, you can theorize how integrated one part of the brain is. May affect another part of the brain. Is that what kind of what you? I know you don't deal in brain injury necessarily, but is that the type of thing that computational neuroscience can do? Um, yes, that and, and more. I would say. Um, so so the the computational neuroscience, um, you know, sort of the mathematical model, the theoretical insights. You know, people who are in the field, you know, come at it from many different angles, and I, it's been sort of described as a patchwork quilt which I, I, I really like because um, we don't know exactly uh, what uh, specifics and models are really going to sort of, you know, uh, make sense once we sort of look at the experimental situation and be able to test things out. So we kind of have to try all many different things. So what is really important is sort of the goal of the particular model of what it's trying to do. So, so just to be specific a little bit, um, you know, for us, I'm very interested in sort of how the different cells, so we have, you know, billions of cells in our brain, um, you know, about as, you know, almost as many as we have stars in the galaxy in the Milky Way. Oops, sorry, are you, I, you're, you're muted. Oh, yes, no, sorry, I was saying, well, it, uh, must have muted? No, no yep. okay, no, oh, um, not, not no, no. I'm yeah. saying you must, you must have said to your husband, uh, husband and you must compare that a lot, the uh, stars in the universe and the, uh, neurons in the brain yes yes <laughs> yeah when my uh, we have uh, two kids. <laughs> yeah, <more. laughs> yeah when our kids were uh, still in primary school um i went in to talk to the class once and um you know talking about you know a little hippocampus i had a little baby rat hippocampus to show the kids and you know made the point and my husband has got in to talk about astronomy and you know just the <laughs> fact that, that there's as many stars in, uh, well, actually, there's about 100 billion, I guess, uh, stars in the Milky Way, and there's about you know um, 19 billion in the in our brain. So 
even though we're working on very different scales yeah <laughs> there's a link <laughs> exactly yeah 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 so yeah so basically what i was trying to say is that there's many different types of computational neuroscience um areas and you know people tackle it in different ways so they might build a model that is very specific to the cell the, the specific cell types in the brain that's sort of the type that we do and you know focus in the hippocampus as you said and there's other people who may very very simplified models but the kind of experimental they touch is at a sort of um, more uh, generic level or just looking at propagation of activity so they come up with theoretical ideas that then we could sort of apply to sort of understand so the patchwork quilt idea which was you know coined i guess i would put it by larry abbott a very um uh, uh you know cool guy in the field like very knowledgeable guy yeah. in theoretical neuroscience he's at yeah. columbia you know said that term and i said that's it exactly because we're all coming in a different ways but we got to attach we have to link right if we're going to sort of we're all touching the experimental data in different ways and different questions and different details, but they kind of have to all be connected in a quilt to bring about our understanding because we don't know exactly what is going to work in terms of being the best uh, help to uh, help us understand, you know, the brain and neurological disease, I guess is how I see it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I thought it was good because I mean, the, 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 the quilt, which is exactly what's on your looking, looking now research lab, the Francis the Skinner Lab dot org slash research oh. and it had I don't know how old that is, but the your uh, convergence. What's it? Yep. Convergence translation. And uh, yeah, and you can explain that and there's a good diagram here of what you yep. do in the computational neuroscience using your hypothesis developments and then how it links to other aspects of of research and uh, and also and the brain is, uh, as, you, as you all know, the brain is just so, it's so complex that it's just, it's kind of fits in well. I would think there's a good, there's a good way to meet the two of the brain tree and computational neurosciences and because you have to collaborate and do it because brain tree is so unique. It happens to every different part of the brain and, and that, and just, and how, and how, how computational neuroscience can really hypothesize about how interactions in one one region of the brain will affect another part of the brain and and uh, and another part of experiment well not really the brain sorry but of the experimental experimental and other sorts of treatments so of other parts of people who specialize in different parts of the brain will get a good idea that aspects of that of their area will affect another area. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know if that yep. was the if there's the question more but yeah, Same. yeah, those are all those are very big questions. But yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I will sort of address uh, what you uh, sort of uh, uh, said in the beginning, which is about this convergence and translation. So yeah. yes, that's yes. that 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 is, um, and and also collaboration and cycling is is sort of the key things because it always has to be an ongoing cycle between you know the the mathematical modeling, the theoretical insight, and experimental data because. If not, then it's sort of like, okay, well, we might have an interesting theory, but if we can't kind of take it back to experimental work and, um, you know, see how it might change, you know, in a normal state, in a pathological state, you know, then it's kind of stuck, right? So it has to be a cycle and by necessity collaboration, because as I mentioned, all the different fields that are involved. And actually at this point, maybe what I'll bring out um, is something I feel extremely strongly about, okay. which is the human nature aspect of this. Yes. As, okay, um, you know, as you said, it affects everybody. That's yeah. one. But yeah. when doing the research, you have all these different fields and someone who's a physicist versus someone who's a we'll, biologist we'll, we'll look has a different, different perspective. Yeah. yeah. You have to have this sort of mutual respect when we talk to each other to be able to interact and collaborate. And so that whole human nature comes in at that level also. So it's, it's I mean, so I, I mean, I love the field, of course, but it, it is about the individual you know, researcher, the individual patient, the individual um, experiment, you know, it, it's always about individual people and you might have giant collaborations, but it's a bunch of individual people who have to have this sort of open-minded, mutual, respectful attitude and, you know, try to kind of work together to, to, to move forward. So so that's sort of just a general comment. So yeah, what collaboration and cycling that point. Um, yeah, so I feel very strongly about that, and you know, we I sort of have a little bit of a philosophical aspect in the graduate course we have about the human interaction because 
um, you know, we have to leave our biases at the door when we sort of try to collaborate and talk to each other because otherwise, you know, we can't we can't move forward. Um, so that's one. Um, the convergence and translation part, um, the way I see that and, and what I intended in, in, in that is that experiments and plus models that are built on experimental data typically would be in, you know, rodents and mammals, you know, crabs, you know, not non-humans because obviously you can't do these kind of experiments at cellular levels. So um, the convergence and translation idea is to try to develop our understanding of network, cellular networks in the, in the brain to derive sort of principles of how the patterns, so in this case oscillations, would arise. And if you have that understanding of what those balances are, you can translate it to a human situation. Um, because, of course, we're not going to have that kind of experimental data. You know, we'll have maybe pieces because of neurosurgeons doing, you know, so some of my, my collaborators, you know, have some human data, but it's going to be like, you know, so again, I made an analogy of a puzzle because this is how I see the mathematical modeling. So you have even less pieces in the puzzle. So if you can translate your understanding from a more complete puzzle based on rodent data, you know, or, you know, even like uh, more invertebrate studies, which you can get down to fundable mechanistic understandings like homeostatic processes, you can translate that to the brain and suggest, you know, targets or um, um, experiments or how to analyze the data that you're getting. You know, so if, if that's what I think about translation. So you converge on an understanding from the experiment data you can excite and then hopefully translate those principles or mechanisms to the human situation. That yeah. that's that's what I mean by that in my personal research overview. I could give you more specific details, um, but yeah. I'll maybe pause there. Okay, great. Well actually and, uh, I was gonna ask you more about just Canberra and uh Cram Cranbell, I gotta pronounce that correctly. And uh UHM, but first why don't you mention invertebrate invertebrates and you can get information from them too, but have you ever this is it, have you ever expanded with the Octopus, I know they have two brains apparently, so uh, that would, that, I don't know how that would affect your, so, that yeah, would he, be interesting, a, yes, have you seen that, that the Netflix, Netflix movie documentary show whatever on it, on the octopus, on uh, this, get this, this, this deep sea dive, and I'm sure, forget who's a scientist or not, but it's watching octopus, the octopus, the octopus lived in this environment in Australia, and it was just, it's fascinating, this, they're amazing. They're, yeah. they're great, amazing creatures. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they they seem extremely brilliant. Yeah I, yeah, I may not have seen that particular one, but I yeah. have definitely yeah. seen yeah, a lot yeah, of those. Seen... They're 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 fan fascinating creatures. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. With... And this, <laughs> it sounds like we could just talk forever about uh, there's the the brain and this. Even though I don't fully, I'm not I'm not I'm not a computational scientist, but just it's a very interesting, extremely interesting field. Um, I just want to ask you finally about just about uh, how you, how the Crandall in your research how is it Crandall that's the that correctly yeah yeah Crandall um, yeah. so, so that integrates into the whole UHN University Health Network in Toronto you know Ontario Canada how that integrates into the whole system so how does your research integrate into I know the Toronto Rehab Institute is there mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, to other hospitals, uh, research hospitals in the University of Toronto, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, in a in a in a nutshell, I mean, it's a fantastic environment and it encompasses many many aspects. So, University Health Network, you know, has you know, part, Crumble Brain Institute as part of it, Toronto General, Princess Margaret Rehab, and all the rest of it. But, well, so we, meaning uh, um, myself, okay. one of the scientists who are at the Crumble Research Institute, the Crumble right. Brain Institute. Um, are, are at the Toronto Western node because that's where the neuroscience focus okay. is. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Don, who's our director, you know, it, he, it's sort of um, integrated in the sense that, you know, we're all sort of, you know, focused on brain disease. Um, there's also vision and arthritis. But yeah, I mean, you have this sort of very tight link to the hospital, which I, for me personally is not very motivating with the models and talking directly and working with neurosurgeons and neurologists and all the rest of it. So when you're building and designing your models and trying to figure out what makes the most sense, it has it could have a practical aspect down the road, you know, because we're not these aren't these problems aren't going to be solved overnight. So if you kind of have the opportunity to sort of 
talk at early stages, that makes a huge difference uh, in, in my in my mind. Because if we're in our silos, you know, it's hard to sort of figure out yeah. what is the best way to integrate. And 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 that's why I mean, it's it's a very novel situation to have the computational neuroscience as part of the research institute. And you know, it's our director and other people in the in the field yeah. that sort of see the importance of these sort of mathematical theoretical approaches, which we need together integrated with all these sort of experimental clinical basic translational um, research that's going on um, to, to move forward in this, I guess I go back to the patchwork quilt. Um, if yeah. the piece is all over the place, you know, you can't make the quilt. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so actually, I guess finally, just to, your final thoughts on, on well, just how it relates to the question or brain injury, how but also have you had anybody from say truck rehab or in their neurological institutes ask you to prepare a certain hypothesis about a, your, use your mathematical models for a certain purpose in the brain injury or concussion research? Yep, yep. So so right now, I mean, uh, we have an ongoing, uh, we just got funded, which was wonderful to really sort of sort of bring a lot of these ideas together. So we've been doing modeling and stuff for many years in the hippocampus, um, you know, from a cellular-based perspective. Yeah and collaborator experimentalists at the Kremble and other places. Um, and a, a fellow neurologist, um, an electrophysiologist, uh, an engineer and myself have now got together and basically we're gonna bring the um, experiments that deal with concussion, like so this would be in rodents, mm -hmm. to see how those oscillations that I mentioned in the hippocampus right. change. And we have, and now we actually have a mathematical model that's developed enough from a cellular perspective that we can sort of analyze the experiment and the model side by side so that we can sort of develop the appropriate kind of analysis tools to sort of link them. And then we could sort of use the model to make predictions about cellular based pathways that are say most affected in like a, 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 a traumatic brain injury type state. Um, so it's, it's really sort of been in that environment and years of discussing and talking. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there's some other things going on, but that's sort of a reason that's very excited about it because yeah. it's going to bring engineering tools that have to analyze the data carefully, the mathematical model itself, which has sort of been developed and the experimental data in, uh, um, in vivo and in vitro capacity to analyze and bring together. So I'm, I'm very excited about that because if that sort of quote unquote holds water, then it sort of is, it can be sort of used as a, as a, a strategy, if you like, across many different brain diseases. So, like a cognitive readout platform. So, I'm very excited about that, and I could talk forever, but I'll stop. <laughs> no, 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 that's that's that is very, and it's also very encouraging to see here how seriously and thoroughly everyone in both UHA and Kremble, but also anyone else. I'm sure, I'm sure not, you're not alone because you're you value collaboration with other institutes, but uh, so how they're out, how uh, thoroughly it's being studied concussion and brain injury and other brain disease are being studied and it's very, very encouraging to hear. So thank you, uh, thank you so much. And uh, do you have any final, any, is there a, a good place for people to find you online or, or um, do you, well, do you we, post we, any online or you just? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I wear part of the Kremble Brain Institute and um, you know, the kcnhub.com where I think I sent you that link. Yes, That's you where, did, yes. Yeah, I'm so I mean, my, actually, my yeah, that website has all kinds of information and links. You know, we're linked in many different ways. But yeah, I guess I, I would say, first of all, thank you for this, for the invitation and the oh, opportunity. Thank you. And, yeah, and I think, you know, we just have to keep talking to each other more at all different levels and be open minded and um, listen to the details and the specifics. And together we could move forward. But it, it is about the details and the specifics and working together. Well, yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. In. And thank you everyone for listening. And, uh, and this is, you know, I'll have all the links to uh, Dr. Skinner's, uh, well, there she is, uh, she's been here first time. But uh, yeah. um, I have all the, all the links to the KCN and Skinner Lab, if that's okay to use. Yep. Okay, yep. and all those links in the description. But uh, thanks again to Dr. Skinner, and thank you for everyone for listening. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound, www.bensound.com.